One American town looks like any other when you see it from an airplane window. Trees line the quiet residential streets, and there's usually a highway running through to an industrial area where many town people work. But in every town, you'll find houses like this, run down, neglected. Trash and litter disfigure the house and yard. An eyesore, yes, and as you'll see, much more. A house that's neglected is the house that may be doomed in the atomic age. What would happen to such a town if it were on the outer fringe of an attack directed at a nearby city? We can answer that question, in part at least, even though it hasn't happened yet. A series of civil defense tests were made to discover the effects of atomic heat on American homes. I am going to show you how protective measures can help guard your home against the heat effects of an atomic explosion. This is the Nevada Proving Ground, where tests were made on miniature houses and various stages of upkeep inside and out. These tests were also made on common fire hazards like dead grass, old leaves, discarded newspapers, and fence structures. Here are five fences placed far enough from the explosion that they could survive the blast. The fences in the middle are built of decayed wood. Dry grass and litter simulate conditions you've seen in too many alleys and backyards in slum areas. The trash, litter, and dead grass are perfect kindling for the unprotected and unpainted wood of the fence itself. The moments tick away as we await the bomb and the fireball. light flash and the heat or thermal wave, then the blast wave. You'll remember the three middle fences are built of rotten wood, unpainted and surrounded by trash. They are immediately ignited. The two outer fences, without litter, are slower to ignite. Decayed, combustible wood surfaces like these fences are readily ignited by heat flash. Likewise, some types of interiors are easily ignited. This will be demonstrated in the next test. Here are two miniature frame houses, identical in structure, both in good condition and well painted outside. Sturdily mounted cameras in front of the houses are to record the effect of heat flash. Large windows purposely expose the interiors to the flash. In the house on the right, all the earmarks of untidy housekeeping. Newspapers and magazines lying about. And cluttered tables. Now the house on the left, identical to the other, but spick and span. Trash has been thrown away. Tabletops are tidy. Two homes, one a fire trap, even under ordinary conditions. The other cleaned up and fresh with better, safer housekeeping. Both ready for the test bomb. The light flash and the heat wave, then the blast tears away part of each roof. Let's see it again in stop motion. First, the light flash and the thermal or heat wave that only chars the painted outer surface of both houses. Then the blast. The cluttered room of the house on the right bursts into flame. In a few moments, the interior is completely ablaze. The fire that started inside spreads rapidly to the house itself, although the house on the left still shows no exterior flames. Now the house on the right burns as fiercely as if it had been deliberately fired with kindling. The lack of fire-safe housekeeping has doomed this house to destruction. In the other house, with its better, safer housekeeping, readily extinguished afterward. Damage, yes, but the house still stands. One house standing, one house leveled, 
both painted and cleaned up outside. Identical houses, except for inside conditions and housekeeping. Now, our third test. Three identical miniature frame houses, each with varying exterior conditions, all the same distance from the point of the explosion. The house on the right, an eyesore. But you've seen these same conditions in your own hometown. Old, unpainted wood. And look at the paper, leaves, and trash in the yard. In a moment, you'll see the results of atomic heat flash on this house. The house on the left, typical of many homes across the nation. Heavily weathered, dry wood in run-down condition. This house is the product of years of neglect. It has not been painted regularly. It's dry and rotten. A tinderbox ready to turn into a blazing torch. The house in the middle in good condition with a clean, unlittered yard. The exterior has been painted with ordinary, good quality house paint. Light painted surfaces reflect heat and the paint also protects the wood from weathering and moisture damage. Let's watch the test now and see what happens under atomic heat. on the right. Notice how the heat wave affects it. There's the fire starting in the trash surrounding the house. Now it spreads to the house itself. In a moment the blast wave and here it comes. is the first to ignite. The trash serves as kindling for the dry, weathered wood. The house on the left smolders for a few moments. Looks almost as if it will not burn, and then bursts into flame. The house on the right continues to burn. Two houses are a total loss, but the well-kept and painted house in the middle still stands. Which of these is your house? This one? The house on the right, dilapidated with paper, dead grass, litter, everywhere. The house on the left, unpainted, run down, neglected. Is this your house? The house in the middle, cleaned up. Painted up and fixed up, exposed to the same searing atomic heat wave, did not catch fire. Close examination revealed only a slight charring of the painted outer surface. Yes, the White House in the middle survived an atomic heat flash. These civil defense tests have proven how important upkeep is to our houses and towns. Now it's up to us, the people, to take decisive action. All right, you say, what can I do about it? What can my community do? All over America, towns and cities are organizing local cleanup, paint up, fix up campaigns. Boy and Girl Scouts and school children of all ages are told how they can help by organizing teams to clean up alleys and backyards. See that you help by removing all of the litter, junk, old newspapers, and trash. They collect and pile up. Your community needs this help. Do those long delayed repair jobs now. Trim your shrubbery and trees, weed, and plant flowers. 
keep your block cleaned up. Beauty, cleanliness, health, and safety are the four basic doctrines that protect our homes, our cities. You've seen the tests, you know the story. Join up with your friends and neighbors for a better, safer community. It's also a good civil defense, which is everyone's responsibility. The dingy house on the left, the dirty and littered house on the right, or the clean white house in the middle. It is your choice. The reward may be survival. You're watching Sleepcore, Pleasant Dreams. This is an official civil defense film produced in cooperation with the Federal Civil Defense Administration and in consultation with the Safety Commission of the National Education Association. Produced by Archer Productions, Incorporated. Hey, Bert, come on out and meet all these nice people, please. Oh, all right. We really can't blame you. You see, Bert is a very, very careful fellow. When there's danger, this is the way he keeps from being hurt. Sometimes it even saves his life. That's why these children are practicing to duck and cover just as you do in your school. We all know the atomic bomb is very dangerous. Since it may be used against us, we must get ready for it, just as we are ready for many other dangers that are around us all the time. Fire is a danger. It can burn whole buildings if someone is careless. But we are ready for fire. We have a fine fire department to put out the fire. And you have fire drills in your school so you know what to do. Automobiles can be dangerous too. They sometimes cause bad accidents, but we are ready. We have safety rules that car drivers and people who are walking must obey. Now, we must be ready for a new danger, the atomic bomb. First, you have to know what happens when an atomic bomb explodes. You will know when it comes. We hope it never comes, but we must get ready. It looks something like this. There is a bright flash, brighter than the sun, brighter than anything you've ever seen. If you were not ready and did not know what to do, it could hurt you in different ways. It could knock you down hard or throw you against a tree or a wall. It is such a big explosion, it can smash in buildings and knock signboards over and break windows all over town. But if you duck and cover like Bert, you will be much safer. You know how bad sunburn can feel. The atomic bomb flash could burn you worse than a terrible sunburn, especially where you're not covered. Now, you and I don't have shells to crawl into like Bert the Turtle, so we have to cover up in our own way. First, you duck, and then you cover. And very tightly, you cover the back of your neck and your face. Duck and cover underneath a table or desk or anything else close by. In Betty's school, they are talking about the atomic bomb, too. Betty is asking her teacher, how can we tell when the atomic bomb may explode? 
and her teacher is explaining that there are two kinds of attack, with warning and without any warning. We think that most of the time we will be warned before the bomb explodes, so there will be time for us to get into our homes, schools, or some other safe place. Our civil defense workers and our men in uniform will do everything they can to warn us before enemy planes can bring a bomb near us. You may be in your schoolyard playing when the signal comes. That signal means to stop whatever you are doing and get to the nearest safe place fast. Always remember, a flash of an atomic bomb can come at any time, no matter where you may be. You might be out playing at home when the warning comes. Then be sure to get into the house fast where your parents have fixed a safe place for you to go. If you are not close to home when you hear the warning, go to the nearest safe cover. Know where you are to go, or ask an older person to help you. You know the places marked with the S sign? There are safe places to go when you hear the alarm. If there is a warning, you will hear it before the bomb explodes. But sometimes, and this is very, very important, Sometimes the bomb might explode without any warning. Then the first thing we would know about it would be the flash. And that means duck and cover fast, wherever you are. There's no time to look around or wait. Be like Bert. When there is a flash, duck and cover and do it fast. Here are some older boys showing what to do if the flash comes when you are not in the classroom. This is what to do if you should be in a corridor. You duck and cover tight against the wall this way. Remember to keep your face and the back of your neck covered tightly. Try to fall away from windows or doors with glass in them. Then, if the glass breaks and flies through the air, it won't cut you. You might be eating your lunch when the flash comes. Duck and cover under the table. Then, if the explosion makes anything in the room fall down, it can't fall on you. Getting ready means we will all have to be able to take care of ourselves. The bomb might explode when there are no grown-ups near. Paul and Patty know this, and they are always ready to take care of themselves. Here they are on their way to school on a beautiful spring day. But no matter where they go or what they do, they always try to remember what to do if the atom bomb explodes right then. It's a bomb. Duck and cover. Paul and Patty know what to do. Paul covered the back of his head so that he wouldn't be burned. And Patty covered herself with the coat she was carrying. They knew how to duck and cover. They acted right away when the flash came. If they had been at this doorway when the bomb flashed, Paul and Patty would have ducked and covered this way, like this girl. Heavy doorways are a good place to duck and cover. She will be safer, too. Here's Tony going to his Cub Scout meeting. Tony knows the bomb can explode any time of the year, day or night. He is ready for it. Duck and cover. Atta boy, Tony. That flash means act fast. Tony knows that it helps to get to any kind of cover. This wall was close by, so that's where he ducked and covered. Tony knew what to do. Notice how he keeps from moving or from getting up and running? He stays down until he is sure the danger is over. The man helping Tony is a civil defense worker. His job is to help protect us when there is danger of the atomic bomb. We must obey the civil defense worker. We must know how to duck and cover in the school bus or in any other bus or streetcar. Duck and cover. Don't wait. Duck away from the windows fast. The glass may break and fly through the air and cut you. Sundays, holidays, vacation time, we must be ready every day, all the time, to do the right thing if the atomic bomb explodes. Duck and cover! This family knows what to do, just as your own family should. They know that even a thin cloth helps protect them. Even a newspaper can save you from a bad burn. But the most important thing of all is to duck and cover yourself, especially where your clothes do not cover you. No matter where we live, in the city or the country, we must be ready all the time for the atomic bomb. Duck and cover. That's the first thing to do, duck and cover. The next important thing to do after that is to stay covered until the danger is over. 
Yes, we must all get ready now so we know how to save ourselves if the atomic bomb ever explodes near us. If you do not know just what to do, ask your teacher when this film is over. Discuss what you could do in different places if a bomb explodes. Older people will help us as they always do, but there might not be any grown-ups around when the bomb explodes. Then, you're on your own. Remember what to do, friends. Now tell me right out loud. What are you supposed to do when you see the flash? Duck and cover. Duck and cover. Duck and cover. You're watching Sleep Core, media for insomnia. These are particles of radioactive fallout. And this is how a single particle looks magnified several hundred times. A radioactive piece of matter from a nuclear explosion. These few particles can't do us any significant harm. But should there be a nuclear attack, many billions of them would fall from the sky and settle to Earth, releasing radiation that could cause sickness or death in the area where they fall. To begin with, it may be surprising to know that radiation is something we live with every day. Far back in time, back before there was an Earth, there were flaming fireballs in space. We call them stars. And there are millions upon millions of them. Each star, like our own sun, is a raging nuclear furnace that shoots out showers of particles too tiny to be matter as we conceive it, along with invisible forces that we call radiation. This radiation and these particles travel through space at fantastic speeds until they strike some other matter which may make new flares of radioactivity. They strike wandering asteroids, moons, and planets such as our own. Everything in space, Earth included, receives this radiation. Skies partly cloudy this afternoon, clearing by... Background radiation is all around us in tiny quantities. 
Nature even planted unstable atoms deep inside the Earth itself. They decay one by one, here and there, in a barrage of inconceivably small and silent explosions. Each explosion is another spark of radiation. All life on Earth has reached its present form in company with radiation from this naturally occurring radioactivity. Extremely thin, with extremely low level intensity, it has always been with us. It is nothing new. We don't worry about the small amounts of natural background radiation. But to safely handle larger amounts, we must keep our distance and shield ourselves. For as the amounts increase, so do the dangers. The amount of energy generated by a nuclear explosion is enormous. Near the crater area, there is almost total destruction from blast and heat. And now, large amounts of pulverized debris and molten earth are pulled up into the mushroom cloud. This is where radioactive fallout is formed. The radioactive atoms produced in the explosion join with the particles of earth and debris. The mushroom-shaped cloud forms and climbs higher. It now contains billions of highly radioactive particles of matter that we call fallout. The strong winds of the upper altitudes go to work on the cloud, blowing it off in one or more directions. Gravity tugs on the particles. The larger and heavier ones sink toward the ground, while the lighter particles continue to drift with the wind. Some of the lightest particles remain suspended in the upper atmosphere. As time passes, their radioactivity grows weaker, so that the longer they remain aloft, the less dangerous they are. But the heavier particles, spread by high altitude winds, fall to the ground within 24 hours. Several miles from the explosion, they are about the size of table salt or fine sand. These are the most dangerous, because they carry the greatest number of radioactive atoms and so emit the largest amount of nuclear radiation. Which brings us to an all-important fact. Deadly as radiation can be. And this gives us an invaluable ally, time. Suppose a nuclear explosion takes place at 12 noon. By one o'clock, the total force of the residual radiation is at a high level. By seven o'clock, it's down to one-tenth. In two days, although still dangerous, it's only one one-hundredth. But in two weeks, it's only one one-one-thousandth. With this decay rate in mind, consider radioactive fallout conditions which might confront us after a massive attack. Within an hour, fallout would be a serious problem in the vicinity of explosions which occur on or near the ground. By seven hours after the attack, the fallout area covers more and more of the country as the prevailing winds expand the fallout in a downwind pattern. 24 hours. 48 hours. Without shelter, millions would face death. A few days later, those who have taken shelter will survive. In many areas, people can even leave shelter for brief periods of time to carry out important tasks. Within two weeks, most people can leave their shelters for longer periods as the radioactivity decays to lower levels. The lesson is obvious. We must shield ourselves from radiation through the dangerous period. To do this, we need more than time. Fortunately, we have another ally. 
distance. The greater our distance from the fallout particles, the less radiation we receive. You would receive less radiation in the middle of a tall building than you would receive on the top or bottom floors because there would be more distance and partitions between you and the source of the radiation, the fallout particles which would cover the roof and the ground around the building. Only an insignificant amount would get inside. And finally, along with decay rate and distance, we have still another and very important ally, mass. When highly radioactive fallout covers our immediate area, we can shield ourselves through the most dangerous period by using the sheer weight of any material. But the protecting material must be heavy. To shield out some 99% of the radiation, you would need about five and a half feet of wood or two feet of earth or one and a third feet of concrete or a half foot of steel. Even though the thickness of these materials varies, they all weigh the same. Taking a house as an example, it offers a small amount of mass and distance from radiation, but not enough protection in an area of heavy fallout. The solution is plain. Fallout shelters are the best defense against nuclear radiation whether in a home for a single family or a large community type in an apartment building, they offer the kind of protection from radiation you would probably need in case of a nuclear attack. But the best shelter would be worthless unless it was used. Most people find it hard to understand how silent, invisible rays, which cannot even be felt, could be so damaging. Let's see what happens when radiation penetrates the body and attacks the cells. What is a cell and what happens when it is attacked? It's a simple organism which reproduces itself by dividing. Our bodies are made up of millions of cells. They're the building blocks of our blood and tissues. Now, powerful radiation strikes, and cells are injured or destroyed. If radiation stops before the accumulated dose is too great, almost all of the damage eventually will be repaired. If radiation continues, there are some cells less able to function at top efficiency. Should the body fall behind in its recovery, severe illness or death could result. The key then is the amount, the total dose of radiation received. We measure radiation the same way speed is measured by a speedometer. Only instead of a speedometer, we have a rate meter and instead of miles per hour, we measure the rate in Rentgens per hour. We need another device called a dosimeter to record how much radiation a person has accumulated over a period of time. In the same way we record accumulated distance in miles, the dosimeter records accumulated dose in Rentgens. With this in mind, let's return to background radiation. In an average lifetime, a person might expect to accumulate about 10 Rentgens from his natural environment. Not enough to affect his health. This same healthy person would need medical care if he received more than 200 Rentgens within a few days. 300 Rentgens in the same period would cause severe radiation sickness or possibly death. And as we go beyond 300 Rentgens, the danger of death increases rapidly. So now we see why shelter is vital. 
The difference between accumulating a large dose because of little or no shielding and a small dose because of adequate shielding is the difference between death and life. No clothing, of course, could possibly provide enough shielding. However, if you were to be in the open during fallout conditions, clothing would keep the particles from touching your skin. There is no such thing as a fallout suit, but ordinary clothing would help until you could reach the safety of a shelter. Then the fallout particles can be brushed off and outer clothing removed. 